they can go as soon as they finish their job, then they can leave. We did have a good time at uh, Paris and Madeline's uh, anniversary party yesterday. That was a really good time. It was a good reminder of family, how important family was, and all the family was there, and also with a friend. We're talking about friends, friendships today. But I did, I did learn one thing. I, I found out that Paris has a middle name. It's Hugh. I saw this cake out there that said Hugh and Madeline, congratulations. And I, I, my first thought was that, that Terry went in to get the cakes and, and he asked for a Paris and Madeline cake. And they said, well, well we got some Hugh and Madeline. Well, that do, and we'll give you $5 off. <laughs> so I figured that's how I got that cake. But Paris told me he didn't even know that was his name for a long time. They, they didn't call me that ever. So he didn't know he had a middle name. But that was a good, that was a really good time. It was a really good time. Um, something else I got to experience this month was I, I got to take my four grandsons to Arkansas State Youth Camp. So I'm, I'm not bumming today. I just I wanted to show you. I, I went to spend a week in Arkansas and all I got was this t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is my camp t-shirt. I bought about the, the boys all one too. But I, but I really had a good time there. It's something I won't ever forget. I don't think there's anything they're ever going to forget. And, and this all came about, I was trying to figure out how to get the boys together. Since was, my son moved away, uh, my, my grandson Ben, who lives in St. Louis, doesn't get to see his, his cousins all the time like he used to. So I was trying to figure out a way to get them together. So this camp kind of came up. Um, and so I, I mentioned it to the director, who's a, a friend of mine, and, and they even asked me to speak on, mon on Monday evening. And so, so uh, right away I thought I'd speak about friendship because of my grandsons. I wanted them to, to hear a message on friendship. And how, how it's important for young people to have friends and, and have a have pick with friends. And I wanted them to keep this message in their hearts a little bit so, so they could kind of keep close with each other. And so I wrote out this message before I even knew what, what the theme was. And, and uh, then a week, a week before camp, the director finally got a hold of me and decided to tell me what the theme was. It, it was a journey. That's what this teacher says, a journey. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I already had my message done. And she told me that I needed to speak on a message about journey and how it's important that the, the, the youth pick good friends and how important <laughs> friendship is. Isn't that kind of cool sometimes that God figures things out for you ahead of time? I was still going to preach on friendship, so I was just glad she came along with me on that. <laughs> and so I want to share that message this morning. So this is a, this is a camp message. That's kind of why I, I dress like this a little bit. And it does apply especially to young people and the youth. We had that, that was terrifying. We had from, you know, three years old all the way up to 23 years old of, of the youth or the camp. And that's a pretty hard group to speak to. Um, so, I, so I figure if I spoke to the three-year-olds, you all would, would enjoy that too. So, um, but even though this applies to youth, young people, it applies to all of us. Because all of us, it's important about friends. We, we need friends uh, not only at the start of our journey, but also as we age. And it's important that we have good friends in order to keep our attitudes positive and our outlook on life positive. You know, there's nothing worse than having people around you who are negative all the time, right? We, we, we've seen that too, how they can influence us in a bad way. And so even you know, as you hear this message, I want you to think about that, how it applies to us at, at any age. So I, I started out by asking them a question, who, who came with a friend? Because I wanted to get, get a money. I, I thought about friends. So who, who came here with a friend? Anybody? Anybody come with a friend? Okay, you, you can count your family if you want to. But, um, has anybody been coming here because a friend asked you to come here? Uh, I was kind of curious about that. You know, I thought we'd have some. Um, anybody invited a friend to come? Ever? I mean, okay. Now, for the rest of us, we haven't raised our hand yet. Does anybody, do you even have any friends? <laughs> <laughs> Meryl asked me that sometimes, too. <laughs> Do you ever wonder what causes us sometimes to warm up to certain people? I mean, you got certain people you kind of get, you, you kind of warm up to them, right? Um, well, what is it that makes us want to be friends with certain people? And the reason I ask that is because I want you to think about that. Think about maybe maybe that's something God has orchestrated for us. But it's it's important. I think we need to understand why it's important to have good friends. So so does God sanction friendship? First question: Does God sanction? Basically, does he give blessing to friendship? Does he, does he approve of friendship? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. I want to start with a little bit of my story. When, when I was in, in elementary school and then into junior high, we called it junior high back then, um, I grew up living in a rental house on the edge of this really nice neighborhood. It was Highland Park in Lafayette. You know where that's at. We lived on the edge of it in a rental house. Um, my, my friends wore Converse tennis shoes. I think those are back now. Um, and and I, wore, I wore Kmart tennis shoes. 
So when we played basketball, they would squeak one on the floor and I would clop. But, and my friends all, they, they rode sting, uh, Schwinn Stingray bicycles, bananas, you remember those. And I, I had a Montgomery Ward um, drive sail bike. It was, it was a coaster rig, didn't have the speeds like they did. And, and they, they also had license plates on the back of there with their names on them, there, on their bikes. Um, I had a baseball card jammed in the spokes with a floating pin. So I was pretty cool with that too. But, you know, I, even though um, some of my friends had some of the cooler things than I did, I still tried to fit in. You know, I still tried to fit in without having all the coolest things. About junior high, things started changing a little bit with my friends. You know, most of them started following, following around with the, cool, the cool kids. So the cool kids became a little more popular. Parties started happening. Uh, many of them decided that was the thing to do. You know, some of them started drinking and smoking and probably doing some things I didn't know about back then, you know, like drugs and things. But back then, I just wanted to fit in. You know, just, it, you know it, I, I didn't feel good about fitting in with the partying so much, but what else was there to do, right, for a, for a 13 or 14 year old? I, and I don't know if anybody else feels that way. You know, maybe you felt that way in the past too. But about seventh grade, I met, I met a new friend who little did I know was gonna change, help change my life. I was invited to Sunday school when I was about seventh grade. It was on a September day, and I still remember going to this little country store, uh, storefront church. We climbed up the stairs into the upstairs where they had their Sunday school class, and I, and I met a new friend. And uh, his name was Thomas, and he was the first high school kid, kid age I ever knew. And he wore glasses like mine, kind of black glasses before they were cool like they are now. He was a little nerdy, so, so we, we kind of kind of kind of fit in together. And I, and I liked him. I, I like I like Thomas. He was holding a Bible the first time I saw him, and they were reading on it. But that was new to me too. I didn't I didn't have a Bible except the little Gideon Bible I got in fifth grade. But Thomas was the first high school kid age that I knew, and the first one that treated me like a friend. And there was something special about him. You know, he seemed like he he kind of knew what he wanted to do even at a young age. He he was kind of guided by something that seemed like it was bigger than himself, and he didn't mind following what that was. And, you know, Thomas knew something about Zig Ziglar way before Zig Ziglar even became popular. This is a quote I, I just like to share. Zig Ziglar said, set out to find a friend and they'll be scarce. Set out to be a friend and they'll be abundant. And Thomas knew about that. He, he already knew this before it was even, that quote even came about. So he started getting me involved in things like quizzing. You know what quizzing is? It's where the, 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 we'd study certain sections of the Bible and memorize it. And then we go quiz against other churches and, and see who, who do it the best, and I learned I was, I was, I was kind of good at that, so, that, so I got busy doing that. Um, he got me into going to the youth groups and, on Wednesday nights. Um, there was camps going on, retreats, so pretty soon I kind of forgot about the parties that were going on with my old friends. I kind of got, kind of got away from that, and so I shared with, with the youth at the camp this, this lesson number one is this, that if you are tempted to do something wrong or you're tempted to follow the wrong crowd, find a good substitute. Find something to substitute. Don't, don't just try to not do something, but find something to fill your time. And that's that's what Tom Thomas helped me do when, when I was when I was you know about 14 years old. So does God sanction friendship? That's our question this morning. Does he want us to have friends? So this morning I want to look at just a story about one of the most famous friendships in the Bible. Maybe you've guessed who we're gonna look at. There's a young man named Jonathan and his friendship with the shepherd boy. Okay, who who we talk about? You, you know him as David, right? So who remembers David? What, what's famous about David? Yeah, the stone. He killed, he killed a giant. He killed a giant. So this is what's famous about David. That he, killed, killed, he killed Goliath. Well, after he kills this giant, King Saul, who's, who's the king, it's, it's uh, Jonathan's father, he takes David into the palace, and he won't let him leave. He keeps him there. And that's when David and Saul's son Jonathan strike up this friendship. They become really, really good friends. So I want to look at uh, 1 Samuel for our scripture this morning, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And here's what Samuel says about this, this friendship. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. And there was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. It's a great definition of friendship. He loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan then sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his, with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. So to understand what was going on here, and, and 
what great a friendship this was. You kind of need to understand what Jonathan was doing here. You know, Jonathan was in line to be king. So he, his father was Saul. He was the next going to be the next king because he was the son of the king. So he was heir to the throne. But his friendship with David was so great that he turned all that over to David. That by giving up his robe, it was a symbol that he was giving that, passing that to David. He was letting David now be in line to be the next king. And it was all part of God's plan. Jonathan kind of understood that. And we know from David's life, it wasn't a great, you know, he wasn't always doing the right thing. David's life was filled with ups and downs, and he made a lot of mistakes. But through it all, Samuel tells us that David, or that Jonathan loved David, kind of like a brother. Loved him as he loved himself, he said. And so I want to look at a few truths about, about the friendship of David and Jonathan as we look at some of, their, some of their ideas of what they did. So I've got all three of them listed there. First of all, Jonathan valued right over relationship. In the next chapter, 19, we won't read that, but it's a story about where, where Saul becomes real jealous of David because David uh, is very victorious in his battles. So Saul becomes jealous, and he wants to kill David. And so Jonathan argues with, with his father Saul. He pleads for him not to kill David. He tells Saul, there's no reason for you to murder an innocent man at all. And so Saul kind of relents. He says, okay, I'm not, I, he says David will not be killed, what he tells, what he tells uh, Jonathan. And so in this story, Jonathan, or Saul, is wrong, and David is right. And Jonathan places what's right ahead of his relationship with his father. And that was a real dangerous thing for him to do, because Saul could have gotten angry with him and, and maybe tried to kill him as well. And we'll find later that he actually does. But Jonathan was also giving up his right to be king by keeping David alive. You know, Jonathan was in line to be the most powerful person in the kingdom, but he gave it all up because he knew it was the right thing to do. And, and there might be times, you know, we struggle with this as well. You know, may, maybe we're afraid to step on toes with people who are doing, doing things wrong because of our friendship with them. But that's when we need to value right over relationship, just like Jonathan did. You know, and, and I, I told the kids there, so maybe they're, you're in a group of people and you start, they start picking on somebody, or maybe start bullying somebody. Or maybe they're telling lies to hurt a reputation or, or to hurt the character of a person. And those are the times we need to follow Jonathan's example and value what's right ahead of whatever relationship that is with the ones who are doing wrong. The second thing I have here is that Jonathan valued principle over position. So in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, we get into another story. And once again, Saul's jealous of David. And he, he actually is so jealous that he goes insane over this. So insanely jealous of David, again he tries to kill him. And, and once again, Jonathan steps in and, and sorry, tries to defend David. And this time, Saul actually tries to kill Jonathan. He throws a spear at him. So his own son he's trying to kill because of this jealousy. And, and because he accuses Jonathan of, 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 being, of not being loyal to his own father, to, to himself. But Jonathan still knows what's right. And he knows the plan David has, uh, or God has for David to be king. And so once again, he's willing to give up his position as the king's son because of the principle of his character. Jonathan never compromises his principles with his friendship with David. And, and once again, you know, we think about those times we're in a group of people and maybe the, the, the talk starts turning into gossip or crude joking or, or, or conversation turns into tearing somebody down. How do we keep from being part of things like that? You know, at any age, how do we keep from being part of things like that? One idea that I wanted to, to share is that if we take care of the small things, we're talking about our principles, if we take care of the small things, then the larger things don't even come up. You know, if people see that, that in you, that even in the small things of your life, you have integrity, then, then they're going to know that in the bigger things, that you also have integrity as well. That, you know, somebody makes a mean comment about another person. You just stand there. Or, or do you speak up? Do you say, say no, that, that's wrong? Or, or do you laugh? Or do you make a comment yourself? And, and it's sad for me to say, but I've been in situations like that before where I, where I didn't walk away like I should have. Or maybe even better, I didn't stop and say, no, this is wrong. You know, I've had to look back sometimes and regret that I didn't do more or didn't do more of the little things like that that I knew were right to do and stand up to the people, the people I didn't agree with on, on how their behavior was. The third thing we have up there then is Jonathan valued faith more than fame. He valued faith more than fame. Jonathan knew God's purposes, okay, from the start. He knew David was going to be king. And so he put his faith in God ahead of all the other things in his, his own life. And that's what we need to. We need that kind of faith to act on what we know to be God's will. 
God's telling us to do something. That's the kind of faith we need, we need to stand, stand by. You know, how many of us have had, had the courage to do what, what Jonathan did in, in this story? You know, it would have been really easy to put ourselves first, would it? To say, well, you know what? I'm going to be king someday, so I'm going to let dad take care of killing David and get him out of the way so that I get what's coming. It would be easy for us to look at things like that. But Jonathan kind of saw his, his, his uh, choice here from a higher perspective than most would. He saw from a higher perspective. And I want to share a, a, a little quick story. Maybe I've told you this already, but last month or so, about a month or so ago, I, I actually got to fly a plane. Did I, did I told anybody that? Yeah. They let me fly an airplane over Purdue. You sign up for this deal, and they let you get up there, and they actually they turn it over and let you take over the control. It was, it's amazing if they let me do this. They didn't know me very well. But, <laughs> but, but when I was on the ground, talk about perspective. So when I'm on the ground, I, I see the plane, I see the ground, the parking lot, the side of the building. That's, that's my perspective. Once we started climbing up into the air, as I thought about this, you, you get closer to the clouds, and all of a sudden, the, the buildings and the planes on the ground, they all disappear. And I, and I couldn't see them anymore. And, and these, these fields, these huge fields, all, all of a sudden turned into little squares. And if you've flown, you've seen this. The little tiny squares, and that's how we kind of got our bearing to, to fly. But um, I saw what they call from a bigger, the bigger picture, from a, from a higher perspective. And that's how Jonathan, Jonathan saw things, from a higher perspective. And that's what friendship can do for us. That's one thing that friendship can do. Friends can help us see things from a different perspective, can't they? We can see things from another person's point of view. And that's one of the most important things we need to realize when we're picking and choosing our friends, that God's purposes should always come first. You know, there, there's a, who could quote Matthew, 6, 633. I don't know if I had it up there or not. You should be able to quote this one. Matthew 633. How's that go? Seek ye first. What? The kingdom of God. And what? Everything else will be added to us, right? That, that's, a great, that's a great verse to keep in mind when we're thinking about looking at things from God's perspective. That sometimes things are small in our lives and we need to see it from, a, from the bigger picture. Okay, finally, the last thing I want to do, I want to talk about one other thing about friendship. In, in, in John chapter 15, did you know that Jesus calls us friends? You know, it's something we need to be reminded of. Jesus calls us friends. And here's what he says in John chapter 15, verse 13. He says, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And this is my command, to love each other love each other. So think about, think about what it means to be a friend of Jesus. What, what does that mean? Think about this for a minute. And, and here's what Jesus says about it. Just the first point, and I think this is one of the most important points, is that he chose you. He chose us. He chose us to be, to be his friend. You know how hard it is sometimes when you want to be friends with somebody and they don't want to be friends back? It, it's kind of an impossible thing, isn't it? But it's not that way with Jesus. He chose us, he chose you to be a friend with. And I, let's just say it out loud. Jesus chose me to be his friend. Jesus chose me. Come on, you can do better than that. Jesus chose me to be his friend. You know, that, you think that's the son of God. You know, he chose me to be a friend with him. I think that's amazing for myself. I mean, I think it's just a wonderful thing. But there's something else he says about this, to be a friend with Jesus. He says that to, to be a friend... Of him is that we do what he says. He says we obey his commands. Is how he how we word it. And he's not being mean about it. I don't think we need to look at this as something he's, he's putting all these rules on us. He's doing it for our own good, so that we can live a good life. Because you see, Jesus is, isn't just an acquaintance. He shouldn't be just an acquaintance. He's not somebody who just heard his name. You know, the whole world's heard Jesus' name, but that's not what he's talking about. The difference between an acquaintance and a close friend is how well that person knows you, right? And how well we know that person. That's the difference on, on what a close friend is. And Jesus is the one, he's the friend that won't use any of that information against us. The more we get to know him, the more he gets to know us. He's only going to be there to help us. So here's a list of things I want to share that, that help you in, in either picking the right friends or choosing the right friends or keeping the right friends. God wants you to have in his life. So first of all, just, just a few little, little tidbits. First of all, we need to guard our mouths about our friends. Guard what we say about our friends. 
I don't, and, I, and I'm bad at this. Sometimes we like, we like to make jokes about things. I do that all the time. You know, I'll make a joke sometimes and I realize that that really wasn't very nice. That could have been taken wrong. And it's more than I need to admit, I gotta go back and try to correct it. It's hard to correct, you know, it's like the toothpaste tube words, you know, you hear about once they're out of the tube, can't put them back in. So we need to be careful about what we say. You know, jokes can hurt sometimes, and I need to remember that too, even if we don't mean it. Second thing is, we need to be careful about gossip coming out of our mouths about our friends. So, so when you repeat something about a friend, you always need to ask yourself, if your friend was standing right there, would you still say that? That's a good question to ask yourself. Or better yet, would you like that to be said about you? So a couple good, a couple good hints here. Here's, a, here's another one. I, this one I like the, maybe the best. We need to look for things that build up our friends, not tear them down. This is important for anything you do, any, anybody you know. You know, it's easy to make ourselves look good at another person's expense, isn't it? Especially if you know something intimate about somebody. It's easy to make, make comments or expose them to ridicule. It might, might hurt their reputation or hurt their character J just so that you can make yourself look better. But imagine having a group of friends who only said and did things that built you up. Just think about having a, friend, a group of friends like that. You know, that, that kind of relationship if you had some friends like that, would set you up for the most unbelievable, positive life you can imagine. Because you know how it feels when somebody says something good about you, right? It's a good, it's a good thing. So imagine if you had friends that made it their goal to only say things or do things to you that helped build you up. Isn't that kind of what Christians are supposed to do? You know, anyway, all, all Christians are our friends. And, and it doesn't mean just say good things about people or say things about good about us just because you want to try to be nice. Because sometimes friends will need to give you some constructive criticism. That's also what a good friend to do. Sometimes we need to hear things like that to, to help us change something we're doing wrong. And, and so, so here's a place to start. Be that person who starts that trend. Be that person who starts that trend. Look for ways to build up your friends. And then the fourth one I had was, and this was really important for you especially, but probably for all of us, we need to be sure and share appropriately about ourselves. This, this is a good, you know, make sure when you share something about yourself that the person you're sharing it with can't hurt you if it's exposed. You've given them information that could hurt you, that, that they are trustworthy of that information. And, and here's a little secret. I wanted to share this especially with the youth at camp. You think that the, the things you share on social media will always be guarded by the people you share it with. What do you think? You, you, you know, I'm going to show my age a little bit with, with my examples, but you might be proud of the fact you've got 700 friends on Facebook. 700 friends, or maybe you got 400 followers on Twitter, and there's probably other social media that I'm leaving out that's new. But how many of those are really good friends? How many are trustworthy? How many can you trust that the information that you share about yourself? Something we need to be very careful of, especially with social media. It's not only not trustworthy of any of your intimate information, but it, it's going to stick with you, and it can be used to hurt you forever. That's one really big point I want to make so, does God value our friendships? Does he sanction friendships? Of course he does. Of course he does. You know, we're social creatures. You know, we, I, I look back and see how much fun camp was. I told him, well, why is camp so much fun? And why is church so much fun? Because we're social people. We, you know, we, we need friends. We need, we need friends to talk to. We need friends to confide in. We need friends to ask help from or for. We need friends to help build us up. And we, and we need friends to help correct us when we're doing something wrong. And, and God wants that so much for us that what did he do? He sent his, his only son, Jesus, to be your friend. Jesus calls us friends. And so once again, isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? God's son wants to be your friend. And he's the only one that we can be 100% sure of to be a perfect friend. He won't let us down. He, he'll always be there to build us up. And he'll be the friend there to help us with what we need to correct you. We need things to, to, to change our ways. We go in a different direction. So, so for the rest of the people that we look at to be our friends, here, here's just some final advice. Choose your friends wisely. First of all, choose your friends wisely. Be smart about picking friends. You know, if you, if, if, if you have a group of people who are doing things you know that aren't right, don't try to be a hero and change them. Go, go find a better friend. Find, find one that, that has similar values to what you have. And, and I, here's a saying I wanted, I wanted especially the youth to, to remember. And this is this. You can ask them, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. 
I think there's a lot of truth in that, in that statement. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You, so do you know what that means? And, and here's what I told him. I said, I'm going to be blunt here. If you're hanging around losers, or you're hanging around people who hate God, and I know that's probably the same person, or same kind of person, if you're hanging around people like that, your future's not going to be a winner. It's just not. You know, um, it's going to be filled with trouble. It's going to be filled with trouble. You're going to be filled with with a life living apart from God if you choose and hang around people like that. But if you're hanging around people who love each other, who, who people who love God and follow his ways, people who call Jesus their friend, then your future is going to be a good one at any age. I think this is true. And especially for the young people who are here today, and I'm going to consider anybody under my age, so anybody under 60 is, is young today. <laughs> I've probably stepped on a few toes already. I was going to say 40, but I thought, no, there's, if you're 45, you're still young. <laughs> But the, the journey starts here, especially for, for you young people. Your journey starts today. And, and I think the first step and part of that journey is choosing friends wisely. Choose the people you want to be around wisely. You know, I, I was blessed to find a friend like Thomas back when I was in middle school. And, I, and some of you know me, know me for a long time, probably know who I'm talking about. Brenda probably knows, I mentioned this morning. But, but this is my friend Thomas. It, it's really Tom. But th this was our picture at camp. You know, that we, I guess you got to stay in that little building there. And, I'll tell you some more about that in a minute. But, but we need to choose our friends wisely. Choose our friends wisely. This goes all the way back to when I was uh, um, actually young. I was 14 in that picture. But th this, this is Tom getting me involved in quizzing. And we're, I'm still friends with him today. He's, st he's still, I consider him my best friend today. You know, it's been over 40 years that we got involved in, in things like that together. So, so that was my camp message. We're done with the camp message. I just want to add one more thing. Just a couple little bit of things about what I learned in this teaching from, from a couple weeks ago. I was thinking about this. I, I had a pastor um, tell me one time that he couldn't have any friends in his pastor because he was afraid he might be viewed as having favorites in church. And, and, I, and I get that. I understand what, what he's saying there. Because it can be a delicate thing for a pastor to try to balance friendship and not be viewed as, as taking friends. But I don't agree with, with the idea of trying to do or trying to go through being a pastor of a church body without any friends. I think that would be a dangerous thing to do. And I do want to say to all of you, I consider every person in this body of Christ to be my friend. Um, some of you have more in common with us. So we do different things together, as all friends do. we got different levels of friendship. But all of you have become my friends. I, I just want to tell you that. That's one thing I thought about as I was preparing this message. And one other thing I learned in this message about myself is I realized and, and I want to share this because maybe you're, you might have the same situation. I realized that thinking about friendships, that I'd let some of my old friends kind of kind of get away. You know, I'd let the closeness dissolve in some of my friendships over some petty misunderstandings at times, and maybe some things that were said that I didn't, I just kind of, you know, kept them on my shoulder a little bit. And I realized that, that I needed to restore those friendships. And, and because I needed, the, I needed those friends to help me keep a positive outlook and not, and not be so negative holding grudges and things. I was able to strengthen my friendship with Tom at camp a couple weeks ago. We even shared a room. She promised me I had my own room. I got there, I had to share a room with him. <laughs> so I saw things I will not soon forget about my friend Tom. <laughs> you know, luckily my eyes were blurry in the morning when I'm waking up. But I even learned first half what a CPAP machine is all about. So that was, that was different. I'm, I'm just praying that I don't ever have to use one of those things. Um, but I'm glad to report that, that my friendship with Tom was improved, it strengthened again, and, and through his encouragement, which another thing friends do, they encourage you, I, through his encouragement, I've also kind of re, reopened some, some, a couple of my friendships that I had that I, I kind of let, let dissolve and let slip in the past few years, and I've been blessed through that. So I want to encourage you to do the same thing. If you've got, if you've got friends you've let slip, that you know are good friends and can be good friends, you go back and restore that. Because God sanctions and he blesses friendship. So choose your friends wisely. And the first one to choose is this, is, is the one who chose you. The one who chose you. And that's, that's a friendship with Jesus. That's the most important. So, so start getting to know him. Start, start reading your Bibles. Um, you know, pick, pick this thing up every day and look through it. There, there's, there's things in here. Read about the one who can save your soul. The one who calls you a friend. There's stories in here about, about the teachings that Jesus has. And there's stories about, about who he is. 
And what better way than to spend some of the time you have getting to know your friend better? So if you're not getting to know Jesus better, then you need to change the things you're doing. Just that, it's that simple. Make getting to know Jesus a priority. And trade whatever you're spending your time on. If you're not doing that, whatever you're spending your time on that's not worthwhile, change it out. Like I said before, you want to, you want to substitute that for something else. Substitute that with time talking to Jesus. Every day, you can do that. It's just important. Listen to his voice, and he will speak to, to his friends.